Roberto Rosario. Thank you. So, I apologize beforehand. This talk was very, very long, 300 slides. I tried to shorten it. Uh, there's a few things that might not make sense, but we are going to be putting two, the two versions, this one and the whole version online. I'm also uh, in the middle of an atrial fibrillation episode, so I will do my best not to faint, at least on, not until I finish. <laughs> Um, and this is going to be my, my last talk and my last appearance at a Django event, and I'm very happy that... Oh, thank you. Okay. Grazie. And I'm very, I'm very happy that it happened here in Italy and, and in an event that from people that I hold very close to my heart, Emanuela and Jacopo, people who have treated us nothing short of family ever since they met us. So, how many of you know what this is? I bet you can't even see it because it is, it is so small. <laughs> this is an Arduino. It is actually one of the sm smallest members in, in the Arduino products. It's actually designed and, and manufactured here in Italy. And it's changing the face of STEM uh, field education because it is, it is making it very uh, affordable and very easy to get into STEM fields. Um, uh, but aside making lights blink, it, it actually has quite a few capabilities. And when properly programmed and applied, it can even help keep someone like me alive at this very moment. So who am I? I'm Roberto. I've been doing software development for a few decades. Um, I'm from Puerto Rico. Quite a bit went long ways. Um, I work for Critical and a company that has been a, a big supporter of Django. Uh, we have sponsored um, the migration work, uh, Django Fresh Framework, uh, the multi-templating um, engine. So we are very fans of, of Django, and we tend to route a lot of our income into Django projects. Personally, I'm known from, from Maya, which is a document management system built on Django. Uh, and it's used by a, a lot of uh, big companies, and, and for example, the state of California, Intel, uh, the University of Montreal, uh, Cemex, one of the biggest companies in the world, Cement, and Deloitte, uh, Tuchin, and Komatsu, uh, one of the four uh, biggest um, uh, accounting companies in the world is using it. I'm also known for um, Austin Django, a, a personal list that started from projects that personally saved my life during uh, doing commercial work, and it evolved into a, a whole completely community project of, uh, of stuff that can help you in a tight deadline. Um, legal disclaimer, I'm not a medical practitioner. Um, this is stuff based on my own experiences. Uh, most of the knowledge I acquired to make this, I got from the internet, especially Wikipedia. I'm not endorsing you to make or build this device, but if you ever do, uh, please take the necessary precautions. <laughs> so w what is an, an, uh, cardiometry? It's just Basically that is measuring your heart. What is electrocardiometry? It's just measuring the electric uh, activity of your heart. And it looks pretty much like this. Uh, this is a commercial uh, printout, for example. If it looks complicated, don't worry. Most people don't understand it. Um, this is a picture of the heart. The heart has many, many systems, a structural, uh, mechanical, and electrical. And we are going to be focusing on the electrical um, system of the heart um, this is called what's called the pacemaker. Is, uh, this is where the electrical signals for the heart initiate. The uh, atrials uh, contract, then the signal is amplified and then routed to the lower side of the heart called the ventricles. Then the remaining energy is recycled and triggers the next heartbeat. So not only, not long, not only this creates the electrical activity, it also keeps the pace of the heartbeat completely independent of the rest of the body. That's, this is why a heart can continue to beat even if it is out, outside the body. So this is what a heartbeat looks like. This is how the electricity in the heart moves. And this is the graph that it produces when it is captured by an electrocardiogram. 
and it looks just like this. It has five main components. The pre-ionization part of the heart where the electricity is uh, being generated, the main heartbeat where the ventricles contract, and the remaining energy that triggers the, ne heart the next heartbeat. <clears throat> so now you understand what all these different peaks and valleys means. Why so many? Because the heart is not flat. The heart is actually a, has a very complex geometry. So most systems, what they do is that they capture uh, with at least six um, monopole um, uh, electrodes, they capture the six main uh, vectors of energy of the heart, and out of those six vectors, the other six vectors can be um, uh, deduced, the AVR, AVL, AVF, and the three other nodes, and we have a complete picture of the electrical activity of the heart. Um, we can also use the remaining uh, electrical activity in the limbs to infer the electrical activity of the heart using differential voltage uh, measurement. And for this talk and this device, I'm going to be um, focusing on the, uh, what's called lead one system, which measures the difference in voltages between the two lower uh, upper extremities and using the lower extremities as a ground reference. And we will get this waveform. And now you understand why there are so many different waveforms, because this is talking about the six uh, initial vectors that are measured, and this has the six other uh, vectors that are um, implied from the measurements. And this is what's called a 12 lead lead system. It's the basis uh, of all electrocardiograms in the industry. This is just for reference what an electrocardiogram machine looks like now, and this is what they used to look like. And before the inventions of uh, ISO vetted um, electrodes, patients had to dip their extremities in salt water to make a, a mechanical connection, an electrical connection. So what is a halter, the name of this project? A halter is a EKG machine that's portable and includes a time component into it. So think of it as a EKG stretch over a long uh, time periods. And it, they look something like this. Um, there are different um, complexities, varieties, and this is a five uh, electro system, there are seven, there are three. The, east, the, small, the simplest one, the simplest amount of, of electrical units is three electrodes. So uh, why I decided to do this, I'm going to be a little bit personal and, and on this one. I'm going to tell you my personal life story, why I, I did this. Um, ever since, since I was young, I was a very frail kid. I had a lot of heart um, um, health issues. I broken so many bones that once, just for fun, I decided to make a gallery on it on Facebook. But then something happened in my life. Someone came into my life that now needed to be protected, and I couldn't be the same frail person. And for the first time, I had to tangle with my own personal psychological issues. I had to change my inner voice from I can to I can. And I, I realized when, once, you have, once you have determination and once you have information, you can pretty much change most of your life's um, situations. And if you have a cell phone, you pretty much have access to the brain share of the, of the human knowledge. So that and determination, and you can do miracles. And I did, and I changed, I, I decided to learn about sport medicine. I, I, I decided that I could do pretty much anything I put my mind into it, and I did. From being a frail kid, a frail, a frail, a frail person, I became very proficient in martial arts, uh, kendo, taekwondo, uh, judo, jiu-jitsu, and kendo, and I hold, still to this day hold degrees, advanced degrees on, on all those. But being protective and strong wasn't enough. I also suffer from a lot of uh, chronic uh, psychological problems uh, stem from hereditary, hereditary diseases. In our, the men, all the men in our family have them. Uh, some haven't survived them. My father, for example, committed suicide at the age of 42, my same age right now, in front of, of us when we were kids. So I couldn't allow that to happen. And again, I changed my mind. I changed my inner voice from I can to I can. Uh, I'm going to research it. I'm going to change this. I can change my current situation. And every moment became an excuse to laugh, and every topic became a fair play for make a joke. So being happy and being strong doesn't pay the bills, doesn't put money on the table. So I needed to also become successful. So I came from a broken family, from an abusive father, from a very a poor family in a poor city, from a poor country that's right now bankrupt and it's being sold in parts to, to, to pay our debt. I don't know if you've seen the situation in Puerto Rico, it's very grim. Yet, I'm here with you, talking to you, wonderful people, halfway around the world in one of the best cities in the world. How could that happen? Again, I changed my mind. 
I, from I can to I can. I became an architect on my own destiny. If I don't have it, I will buy it. If I, can buy, I can't buy it, I will banter for it. If I can banter for it, I will invent it. So my main message is, whatever your life situation is, you can change it when you put, put your mind into it and you research your own topic. And that became my mantra. Happiness, success, and health. And think, the thing about life is life is like a, a mirror. The more you put out, the more you're going to get. And all of a sudden, I was getting these incredible life experiences. I, I was meeting, actually, my heroes. And they knew me on a first, uh, first um, name, personal basis. And even when you think it cannot get any better, it did. I actually met that of my life. And, uh, And I asked a very important question, and she said yes. And it was actually thanks to Django Village that I managed to do it. So also another round of applause for Jacopo and everybody who did Django Village. They helped me with that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I was pretty much living the dream. I, I was doing everything we read in fairy tales. It can happen. And the thing about having a partner in law is that also it can percolate in all the aspects of your life. And I left my job uh, in the government and we started a company, something I was completely afraid I thought I would never be able to do. And I did. And now we have three different companies right now. And I was traveling the world. I was seeing all these places I, all, I, I read on in magazines I thought I would never be able to see. And I was seeing them. And I, I can now say things I thought only millionaires could say. I have friends practically in all continents of the world. I was literally on top of the world. For the first time in my life, I was complete. But then, it all came crashing down. And all of a sudden, I found myself saying goodbye to my wife with my last breath and leaving her a message for my son. I was suffering for all these heart conditions that I neglected. They decided all to come to me back at once with a revenge. I was suffering from atrial fibrillation, tachycardia, uh, murmurs, uh, premature heartbeats. There was so little blood pumping to my brain that I was suffering from hypoxia and acidosis, and my organs were actually shutting down, and they did. All of a sudden, I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't see anything. Everything was pitch black. But I still had my mind. I didn't know if I was dead or alive. Luckily, I survived it. A lot of studies, a lot of patients, a lot of being prodded, tested, analyzed. It was discovered, it was um, documented, all the heart conditions I had, and I started getting treated for them. I actually had, I had to do a heart ablation. They actually had to burn several nerves inside my heart to make it work a little bit better. But that doesn't fix anything because uh, heart conditions are layered. When you fix one, you, under, you uncover all the ones that are beneath them, that are being op opaque electrically. And they did. And visits to the heart, to the emergency room, became routine. I became very depressed. I became practically non-functional. Out of 24 hours, I had to lie down 23. I was disabled. I was depressed. I couldn't work. I couldn't do anything. And once again, I remember all the changes I have managed to do with my life when I was healthy. And in comparison, they might look easier. And I realized it's just the same. I need to change my inner voice. I, have, I didn't know anything about electrocardiography. But I have determination and I have the information. I decided to change my own situation. And I decided to see what the problems with my heart conditions were. The first thing is you need information about yourself, and medical devices are very expensive. And even if you have money, sometimes you need a license to get them. And even if when you get them, they fail. And even if when, when they work, they only work for a, sever, a, a very small amount of time. Uh, halters only work for 24 hours, and they record a very limited amount of information. Excuse me. And then I, analyzing the problem, lying down in bed, basically bedridden, I started to analyze the problem. And I realized a halter is just a data logger. And I had a lot of experiences with data loggers. I can spend my 23 hours a day doing research and design. And in the one hour I had therapy, I could just stand up and do prototypes as, as part of my therapy. And I did. I, I set up 
my own therapy workshop in my office. The messier, the better. And after many nights of tinkering, I came up with my first prototype. From knowing nothing about heart diseases, I had my first proof of concept of an electrocardiogram in two weeks. So even if you're bedridden, you can still do something to change your, your current situation. I decided that maybe other people were having the same problem, or maybe for whatever reason. Maybe I could make this easier for myself and for others. And I set up my shopping list. What, what are the things I want to do with this? I want to source parts that are the easiest to find as possible. I want to make this modular. This is why computers are so easy to build nowadays, because you just buy parts and you connect them. I put myself in the challenge of creating an electrocardiogram machine that will work in the same way. You just buy the parts, connect them, and you have a rough device that you can use for yourself. And this is the first prototype board that I created. This is the first development platform. And as you can see, it's just seven modules that you just connect together, put the firmware on it, and you can start doing um, electrocardiographic analysis. This is the same, the six uh, basic components of the system. is the human interface part, the microcontroller uh, unit, the graphical user interface to change from the different modes that the device can do, the real-time clock, a power management unit, and a storage device to storage the recordings over long times. I'm going to just browse over this um, very fast. And this is the selection process of all the parts. The criteria was easy to source, cheapest as possible, easy to connect. So most of these devices use I2C or SPI protocols, which are very, very easy to get together working. The MCU for choice was the Arduino because it is so, so pervasive. I have very um, good experiences with these brands of uh, batteries and technology, and instead of using, for example, LiPo batteries that can uh, heat up and, and catch fire, I decided to do uh, um, less um, power to weight ratio, but a safer technology. Um, on the display, I use uh, OLED technology. Uh, for the storage, I realized that uh, SD card was the best choice. And this is how the, the, the uh, interchip communication works in the device. For the lead system, the connectors, there's a whole array of commercial connectors. And eventually, I settled down on the connectors I'm wearing right now because they are the most easiest to find. They're very easy to interface. And I realized that using just a microphone and a headphone 3.5 millimeter jack, I could connect to it. And this is what it, it is using right now. So it looks like black's magic, but once you get to it, it's just the type of physical connection you will find in a headphone. And this is the device working right now. As you can see, thank you. As you can see, my heart rate is 147, 150. <laughs> That's the heart rate of a, a performance athlete running a marathon. That's how hard my heart is trying to keep me on my feet. If this goes on for another hour, I might have to spend the night in the hospital. But as grim as that sounds, I'm glad because I know my, what my limits of my heart are right now. I can actually monitor my health right now as I speak to you and know if I, if I have to go running and ask for help. For the electrodes, I also did a little bit of research and I learned this, a, a whole array of electrodes. Um, there's some for um, immediate use, like minutes or hours, but if you're gonna do sports, um, there's cloth ones that are um, resistant to sweat and you can use them even as you do exercises. So I'm using those when I'm doing um, therapy, for example. For the firmware, the actual software in the device, because this is an ongoing project, is going to be changing. I decided on a modular technology, trying to not do a monolithic kernel and do it in uh, different modules using um, um, object-oriented programming. And I wanted at least three modes of operation. The one that I just showed you, which is the immediate display. 
I wanted to be able to record things in the SD card, and I wanted to throw, um, send data to the computer via the serial port or the USB, and plot that also in the computer for capture later into a Django um, application that also is part of the project. I'm going to skip very far fast for this. If you want information about this, go please go see the entire um, uh, slides in, on, on the internet, why all these uh, different Jan Arduino um, libraries were chosen. Um, there's a lot of challenges doing these kinds of devices. There's a lot of things that can happen that, uh, can, that can go wrong with having a lot of electronics of, of this sensitivity working together. Um, the Arduino is not the best place for, do, for doing um, analog to digital conversion if you want precise. So we have to, I had to do a lot of tricks. And by piping the square wave generator of the real-time clock into the Arduino, um, I'm able to trigger an interrupt that then can go into the ADC converter and get very, very, very reliable samples. So reliable that I can get 100 samples per second, and that's commercial quality sampling rate. So this is basically how the device captures data. The real-time clock triggers an interrupt in the Arduino, which um, buffers data into a variable, a shared variable, then has a flag telling the loop that's saving the data into the card. There's data in the buffer, go dump it. And pretty much it is doing a multi-threading, a real-time hardware-based interrupt-driven multi-threading at the Arduino level. Um, a lot of people have gotten very excited about this, being able to do multi-threading processing on the Arduino. And we are talking about maybe even creating a whole framework where you can create applications of the Arduino where you can have multiple processes working at the same time, something that is very rare on the, on the Arduino. This is the file format that was created. Uh, as simple as possible, it's just a text file. The left column is just the delta in time in milliseconds, and the right values are just the voltages being uh, recorded by the device. Uh, we also had to, I also had to do heart rate, heart rate um, detection. Our heart rate is a very complex wave. You can do Fourier transformation to um, <coughs> simplify it into all its sine wave components, but that's very hard to do in an Arduino. So I, dis I realized that I, only, I was only interested in the QRS complex of my heartbeat, the, 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 the biggest um, part of the heartbeat, and I could do just um, amplitude detection on that. I, I only needed to detect this part of the heart wave to be able to infer my heart rate. So I did a differential analysis of the heart amplitude variations, and then using a, um, a mathematical algorithm called local maxima, using um, maximum value detection that degrades over time, we are able to do a, a scale peak detection that degrades if there's no heartbeat being detected, and then just in case, just to filter a little bit more, there's a threshold component. And the algorithm worked very nicely. The blue line is my heart rate, and the red uh, markers are where the device is detecting my heart rate. And even when there's a, um, a moderate amount of noise, it is still able to recognize my heart rate. And with that, I can then calculate heart rate per minute. The device was built using uh, a layer um, method to be able to squeeze some, the most amount of components in a little box. And I did it, I closed my eyes, I plugged myself into it, and it worked. So pretty much the master was complete. <laughs> and all the goals of the project were met. met. Um, this is the real-time display in action, and this is the, the device sending data to the Arduino um, IDE for plotting. The total cost of the device is just $30, minus the cost of the leads and the electrodes. Um, commercial, um, whole two devices only have 128 megabytes of RAM. Mine has four gigabytes. They last just one day, mine lasts 12. So I can basically just stay my whole, I can keep it on my whole stay here in, in Firenze. And when I get back, I will have a whole complete historiogram on how, how my heart rate behaved during my whole vacation. Of course, I'm not going to wear this in public. It's going to be hard to explain. So the application, um, talking to my doctor, he was very happy and excited that one of his uh, patients actually wanted to learn about his own heart condition. And he told me, please send me whatever data you are recovering, because it is actually going to help me help you, because I can only put you a whole device for 24 hours. You're going to have this 
all the time. And you're going to be able to detect all your episodes and send them to me, and I can see them in action. So um, I decided to create an app to keep a journal of all the recordings. Uh, I needed to be able to download the recordings, render them, split them, uh, slice them, and put some kind of metadata. I felt bad, I felt good, I ate this, I ate that, to see the correlations between my activities and my episodes. And I realized that I had everything I needed to create this app in Mayan, because Mayan is not just a document management system. It is a platform. It builds on top of everything Django provides and then provides many, many more things like object access control, uh, role-based control systems, um, a lot of uh, reusable templates. So this is the basic functionality that I needed to create Mayan apps. We have a cookie cutter template that will give you a bootstrap of, a, of an app. To register the application in Mayan, you just create a, an instance of a link, which is a smart anchor, HTTP, HTTP anchor, and you register, you register it in one of the menus, which are just hot zones where you can put links. So navigation is taking care for you, which is something Django doesn't naturally do. And once you do that, automatically, the button to launch the application is available in the tools menu. To hold the recordings, it's just a matter of creating a Django method for each recording, and then a submodel for all the different values of a recording, all the electrical values, and a method of that model for to do the processing to convert from milliseconds to a date time, from Django date time. To, to create the views, Mayan uh, uses the Django um, class-based functions uh, using uh, class-based views and subclass some class them, providing you a lot of uh, boilerplate. <laughs> and creating views on Maya is this simple. This is the create recording view, this is the delete recording view, the detail, and the list. And then you create link instances for each of those, those views, and then you register them um, to, for the corresponding Django model. And every time a, record, a recording model instance is present in a view, these links will be shown to you. So as I said, um, navigation, which is a big pain in app development, is taking care for you in Maya. And this is what the recording upload form looks like. This is where I take out the SIM card, I put it, and I upload the text file that this device produces in this form. And it will give me all the really different recordings automatically. It will extrapolate the date and the time where those recordings were made. To visualize the recordings, I needed some app that was able to give me a display of a lot of data, because this, this, can, um, this data can span days. And I have, that, I have had very good um, luck, luck with the DIY graphs, because they provide a very nice uh, historic, um, historical uh, Instagram, Instagram um, selection tool. So it was just a matter of encapsulating the JavaScript app into a Django widget. To feed the widget, we create an API endpoint. Mayan uses Django REST framework with a lot of boilerplate taken care of. And then we feed that to the widget via JavaScript. To be able to present the graph and the metadata I wanted to add for each recording, Mayan provides a special class called a multiform view, which is a class-based uh, view, and you just dis, um, put all the formed classes that you want to appear in that form, and it will render, it, render you this view. And you can see here is the rendered preview of a recording. And now I can then select a slice of a specific, for example, here I have uh, a missing heartbeat, a missing QRS complex. This is, an, uh, for example, an episode of an arrhythmia. And I can then put a comment here, I, had, I, I was eating uh, spicy food, and I can tag it uh, with a Rhythmia tachycardia text. And when I click Capture, the widget will create a screenshot of that graph. It will give me a base 64 image, then we convert it into a JavaScript blob and send it via the API to Mayan, which is just a API call to the documents. We get a primary key, and then we attach the comments and the tagging and every other metadata to that IP. And this is what we end up with. We end up with a journal of my different recordings, the preview, and all the tagging of the symptoms I was having at a specific moment in time. 
And because this is now a Mayan document, I have um, active previewing, I have commenting, I have indexing. So I, in Mayan, I can create a custom template. And all my, of my recordings are going to be automatically um, categorized hierarchically by whatever um, variables I was using in the templating system. And because Mayan, everything is searchable, and I can, uh, I can, for example, put any term I want. For example, I put spicy, and it will give me the recording in which the word spicy appeared. I can also do advanced search. I want to use, I want to find all my recordings with the tag Kakikardia and the uh, spicy keyword, for example. Future, I want to make it wireless. I want to add a panic button. So if I'm feeling bad, I can press it and will notify my contacts by SMS or by my social media. We have had very good luck creating single board computers where Mayan is available. So one user um, uh, mentioned that with what you can hold into two hands, using this and this, you can actually have a cardiologist's office on your own hands. And it can be very useful for villages where there's no electricity, there's no internet access. Um, natural disasters where infrastructure has collapsed, now you have two devices that you can carry, that you can power from a car battery or even a solar panel, and you can do emergency services on the field. This is the second generation that we're working on. It's 20% uh, smaller and it's already wireless and it's using another uh, ISP, the ISP 8266, which is already wireless. No time for demo, and I will take your questions later on if, if there's time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto, for this touching story.